Our first speaker for today is Dr. Matt Boyd. Matt is a philosopher and a researcher who focuses on areas such as strategy, prioritization, and ethics of health, technology, and global catastrophic risk. And during his talk today, Matt will tell us about his involvement in mitigating the COVID-19 crisis in New Zealand specifically, and how we can respond to the threat of global catastrophic biological risk at large. Uh, just a side note, we encourage our audience to ask questions during the session uh, by submitting them uh, in the question chat box on Swapcar. You can find this option on the right side, right hand side of your screen. Very glad to have you here today with us, Matt. Over to you. Great. Uh, just I'll just share my screen and um, and we can get underway. Right, hopefully, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so look, uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm here speaking from New Zealand. Um, I'm going to be talking about COVID-19 um, pandemics a bit more generally and, uh, and, and existential risk. Um, I first just want to acknowledge uh, a co-author on some of the work that I'll be talking about today, um, Professor Nick Wilson, who is a public health physician in New Zealand and has been one of the, um, yeah, a, a vocal advisor of the government during New Zealand's COVID uh response and um i'll just also flag that you know th there may be things on my slides that i don't specifically talk about but um you know you're welcome to, to watch the video of the conference and and you know go back for, for any extra details that that interest you so uh just a quick outline of the talk i'm going to spend the first um maybe 15 minutes talking about uh the concept of uh of border closure as a pandemic strategy for island nations and then about new zealand's pandemic response more broadly and then the uh, the second phase of the talk will be focusing on uh, you know the the, the talk of, topic of this conference global catastrophic and existential biological risks um, and some of the issues in uh, you know in approaching these and managing these. So uh, flash back to 2017, and New Zealand had just uh, written a new influenza pandemic plan, and I was at the Ministry of Health. Uh, New Zealand Minister of Health with, with Nick, and we were having a tour of the Emergency Response Centre there, which you can see in the in the photo. And we were there because um, we we wanted to discuss the the pandemic plan with with the Ministry of Health. And um, this was because our research uh, had led us to conclude that uh, under certain circumstances, the most rational response to a to a severe pandemic for an island nation was to was to close its borders. Um, and uh, this was not explicitly in the in the pandemic plan. And, and basically, to cut a long story short, we were told at that meeting that border closure will never be a policy option, um, and that um, you know our work was interesting, but but wasn't really of any particular um, use or relevance um, to to the ministry. But look, we had our reasons for for coming to that conclusion, and uh, you know we can. I just put the, the laser pointer on actually. Um, uh, you know, we can look back to the 1918 influenza pandemic, and the figure here demonstrates that um, island nations in the Pacific the, the, that had a strict maritime quarantine that basically had closed their borders to some degree, um, represented by the blue squares here, had almost no deaths uh, attributed to, to the pandemic, and the arrival of the pandemic was generally much later than it was uh, at, other, at other islands, uh, comparable islands, um, giving them time to prepare as well. And that this was actually quite a quite a striking finding that the differences were were great, uh, and so we we sort of decided to explore this a bit more on the basis of this historical evidence, and we conducted two modelling studies, cost effectiveness analyses, looking specifically at the New Zealand situation, and trying to sort of elucidate the the situations where border closure might be rational from a from a uh, both a health and a cost effectiveness uh, perspective. And you know, we found that the, the evidence was quite clear that if a, if a pandemic was bad enough, perhaps you know, uh, five times or 10 times uh, the impact of 1918, there was really no question that you, you should close the border and, and you could only win from both health and, and economic perspectives. Um, but in addition to that, we then studied some of these islands that had succeeded in closing their borders uh, against the 1918 pandemic and we elucidated some success and failure factors. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it boiled down to things like uh, the degree of remoteness, whether there was advance warning of the, the emergence of the pandemic, um, military decision makers, quarantine and armed guards seemed to play a role um, in, in various locations. And things that sort of uh, meant that, uh, that border closure was likely to fail as a strategy include 
uh, a delayed border closure if, if an island waited too long, uh, and also if their um, if their quarantine facilities uh, failed in some way and that there was leakage of the of the pandemic into into the island. Um, and we basically uh, spoke at a conference in, in Rotorua in New Zealand and, and outlined what an island nation might need to do ahead of time to ensure that border closure could happen um, quickly enough and would be effective. And this included uh, specific kinds of planning, preparations for rapid decision making, particular types of legislation that might uh, be required to, to you know, allow for the legality of such, um, of such decisions, and maybe various mechanisms for compensation of uh, industries that are impacted by border closure, like uh, like tourism industries and, and so forth. Um, but to be honest, there was really little interest in, in this uh, thinking uh, at, at this International uh, Union for Health Protection, Promotion and Education conference, um, and it was sort of shrugged off. Um, and we, we sort of uh, went further and we, we wrote another paper which, uh, which analyzed what kinds of biological threats you might plausibly want to close the border against. And we went through um, the World Health Organization's list of priority diseases and some other lists of various bioweapon related diseases and threats. And we um, broke these threats into those with relatively low case fatality risk, those with relatively high case fatality risk, and those with low transmissibility and those with high transmissibility. And really uh, what fell out of this analysis was that there's sort of four situations where you might consider closing the border as an island nation. Um, these are situations where the threat is such that the trade-off between you know, the economic impact um, and the health benefits uh, are in your favor. And these were situations of non-seasonal influenza uh, approaching the severity or, or worse than the 1918 pandemic, uh, a smallpox pandemic, um, or emerging diseases that we're unfamiliar with. Uh, an emerging disease X, which has uh, crossed from non-human to human uh, species, or a, which COVID-19 is an example of, um, or a novel synthetic disease, something that has been manipulated or created in a laboratory or through uh, bioengineering processes, which, which may have features or behavior you know, uh, worse than or unlike anything else that, that we're familiar with. And we, we highlighted that um, speed is of the essence. You must uh, enact the border closure uh, early before the threat has arrived and that to enable speed, um, there should really be decision criteria and thresholds that are, that are pre-worked through so that decision makers can uh, basically you know, tick the boxes and, and rapidly make uh, the decision. So um, that was the sort of work we'd done ahead of COVID. So what happened in New Zealand when COVID-19 uh, struck? Well, initially in, in February of 2020, New Zealand implemented uh, the sorts of policies that were consistent with that 2017 pandemic plan and that we were seeing around the world, such as you know, screening travelers that were arriving from certain, uh, certain locations such as China, um, you know, and advising people to um, uh, you know, see, see their health professional if they were, if they were having symptoms. Um, but it quickly uh, became apparent that um, you know, COVID was probably likely to hit New Zealand uh, with a bit more force. And at first, the messaging coming out of the government was that, well, New Zealand, you know, it's an OECD nation. We're, we've got uh, a, a world-class health system, and, you know, and we'll be able to cope with, with this uh, onslaught. But as uh, events in Italy, Spain, New York, and so forth uh, uh, started unfolding, uh, it became rapidly apparent that New Zealand's health system was not up to scratch. We had nowhere near enough intensive care beds. The Ministry of Health didn't even employ any epidemiologists. There had been decades of neglect of investment in public health infrastructure. And really, things were looking pretty grim. This is when we only had three cases uh, in the country. So what happened is the government decided that uh, we needed to buy time, we needed to prepare ourselves, and the border was closed, even though that was not anticipated in our pandemic planning. But there were already cases in New Zealand um, albeit there weren't going to be any more arriving because the border was closed um, and, and the border was separated from the country with a, a mandatory 14-day uh, quarantine um, facility, which, which was managed by the government. Um, so, so new cases weren't likely to arrive, but we needed to track down and, and isolate and eliminate all the cases that had already arrived. And, and this is exactly what happened. So a lockdown was, was implemented in order to prevent further transmission a very strict lockdown. People basically had to remain at home unless they were out exercising by themselves or buying food. Um, 
and uh, test and trace um, protocols were, were developed and uh, all, the, all the cases in the country were basically found, isolated, um, and eventually on May the 4th, um, New Zealand had, had zero cases. Uh, and during that period, the government strategy had, had pivoted from a, uh, a sort of a suppression strategy or a mitigation strategy um, to an elimination one when it became apparent that elimination uh, was actually going to work. And so what we see in this, in this figure here uh, is the, a, tra a trace of the, um, the, the government's um, restrictions, the stringency of the restrictions over time. The blue line is New Zealand, and I've put in uh, the Netherlands there as well for comparison. And what you see here is uh, in March of 2020, New Zealand implemented these very strict lockdowns, more strict than, um, than what was going on overseas. Um, but we were able to, to release those lockdowns relatively quickly because uh, there, were, there were no cases um, uh, remaining. And for the majority of the 18 months subsequent to that, there were very few restrictions in New Zealand at all. And this is because when cases did leak through the quarantine system at the border, um, lockdowns or, or large increases in the restrictions were implemented rapidly and the cases were eliminated again back to zero. And this happened on multiple occasions. Um, so it was clear that this method uh, was actually successful in uh, eliminating a, a disease like COVID-19 uh, whenever it emerged um, you know, within, within the country. And we'll just, just ask you to hold that thought because that's, that's relevant to um, the emergence of, of this sort of epidemic uh, you know, at its origin in, in general. Um, so look, the, the, to date anyway, New Zealand has suffered only 28 deaths from, uh, from, from COVID-19. And that, to put that in context, you know, a country like Ireland uh, has a similar population to New Zealand, and it has suffered, I think, in excess of 5,000 deaths. So, so the health outcome from this approach uh, was, was very good. Um, and, and just to highlight some of the success factors there, the, the border closure was, was clearly key. Um, it, it, it ensured a low caseload at, at the outset, and, and that contact tracers and testers could, um, could manage with, with the number of cases that were, that were already in the country. And that, and that ongoing use of brief, strong lockdowns, uh, strong public health measures, um, which may be considered by some as an overreaction, uh, but they worked very quickly and effectively. Um, the, another factor that New Zealand had going for it, which I'll return to later when I talk about the, the idea of island refuges, is that there's a strong social cohesion within New Zealand. There was very much this sort of um, what was known as the team of five million uh, approach and um, for the majority of that period of time, people were supportive of the of the approach, um, and and there was consensus that this, that this was the right approach. So just a couple of figures here to illustrate uh, the the impact of of this approach uh, for New Zealand. The top figure demonstrates the uh, the number of deaths per million um, attributable to to the pandemic, and on the the left-hand uh, bars here is, is Europe, which is showing that there's somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 deaths per million on average. And then away over here on the right is New Zealand, and New Zealand has suffered uh, something like minus 400 excess deaths per million, meaning that um, 400 fewer people have died than were expected uh, in normal times, largely because uh, the measures also kept uh, things like influenza at bay as well. And then economically, uh, we see down here in the lower graph, uh, this is the, the change, you know, change in GDP quarter on quarter. And we see for the second quarter in 2020, uh, both the, the OECD in the blue and New Zealand in the green had substantial drops in their GDP. But in the, in the following quarter, um, there was a bounce back and New Zealand's bounce back was substantially greater than the GDP bounce back in, in, uh, across the rest of the OECD. So but from both health and economic perspective, when comparing to other countries, it seems like this had been a very good approach. But this has been a very expensive approach. The lockdowns have been horrendously expensive and have required tens of billions of dollars of government support and wage subsidies and, and various other contributions. And so obviously New Zealand would have been better to have avoided the lockdowns um, and, and closed the borders earlier before there were any cases uh, in the country. And so there's really two Two, two pillars that, that could have been much better in New Zealand's response. One is the speed of action, 
and one is the uh, the existing infrastructure and uh, around the health system and so forth that could have been in place ahead of time. Uh, you know, if, if uh, decision makers had been thinking about these sorts of these sorts of threats. So, you know, speed could have been enhanced by uh, pre-existing decision criteria around border closure. Um, uh, Things that might have been implemented ahead of time, like the capacity for wastewater testing, um, you know, PCR of, of wastewater samples. There could have been uh, a, a contact tracing workforce that was pre-trained. There could have been better uh, contact tracing apps. We could have implemented genome sequencing earlier, which helped uh, make connections between between cases and make sure that we had ring fenced outbreaks. There are a whole lot of things that could have been a lot quicker, and then. There are a whole lot of things that could have been invested in ahead of time that might have meant that uh, uh, you know lockdowns weren't needed, um, or uh, or you know or the strategy might have been modified in some way. And these are things like protect, protective equipment stockpiles. Um, you know that the, the purpose-built isolation and quarantine facilities might have meant that that system could have been up and running before before cases had arrived in the country. Um, you know, and, and I talked about ICU beds and surge capacity and so forth in hospitals. And, and all these things, you know, uh, could, could have been addressed at, at ahead of the pandemic. So although there have been good health outcomes in New Zealand and uh, good economic outcomes when compared to other countries, the uh, strategy has been incredibly expensive um, and it did eliminate an industry, uh, international tourism. Although, you know, I do add that uh, it's unclear to what degree the policy uh, impacted that directly because um, uh, passenger travel around the world has, has been, you know, decreased so much during the pandemic that, um, you know, e even if borders had remained open, that, that industry would have taken a massive, uh, a massive hit. Um, but look, the, the, so, so we can, we can uh, debate whether border closure was uh, justified or appropriate for a pandemic of the impact of COVID-19. And you know, our research really, our research had clearly showed that you know ha had it been as bad as or worse than 1918, then that's really a no-brainer. But um, you know we, we could argue back and forth about COVID-19. But what if what if the disease had had a case fatality risk of 10% rather than less than 1% or 50% or more? Um, what would be the rational approach to managing this sort of outbreak? And this brings us into you know, the, the second phase of this talk, which is where uh, I want to focus a bit on global catastrophic and existential biological risk. So just a, a couple of quick definitions here. A, uh, a global catastrophic biological risk is one that threatens widespread disaster beyond the collective capability of national and international governments and the private sector to control. So we can debate whether COVID-19 meets that threshold. Uh, and possibly it doesn't, because in, in many jurisdictions, Singapore, South Korea, New Zealand, um, you know, the, the capacity of, of the government and the private sector to, to control the outbreak seems to have been, uh, you know, sufficient. Um, but uh, then there's existential risks where, um, you know, these are risks that threaten the destruction of humanity's long-term potential, um, either by extinction or some unrecoverable outcome. And I'll just add that uh, that these uh, definitions apply whether the, the threat is natural, um, you know, accidental or, or some deliberate act. So could a natural pandemic be a, a global catastrophic biological risk or even an existential risk? Well, um, here's a, you know, the, the, the short answer to that is maybe. Um, and he, here's a figure which demonstrates um, the uh, intensity and, and probability of, uh, of, of epidemics. This is derived from a set of 400 or so outbreaks or, or outbreaks across 400 years. Um, and just to, to anchor the, the trend here, you can see down on the bottom right, this is the 1918 influenza. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and if, we extrapolate, if we extrapolate this trend, we, we might anticipate that something, uh, a, a, a pandemic with, with an order of magnitude more impact than the 1918 uh, uh, pandemic might be expected to occur with a probability of uh, perhaps 0.1% per year uh, or something like that. So rare, but conceivable. But even something in order of magnitude greater than 1918 is, is not an existential threat. Um, but what about, uh, you know, human, human uh, action? Could this lead to some sort of uh, catastrophic pandemic or existential threat? Well, if we look at just influenza to begin with, um, there have been estimates of the, the probability of uh, laboratory work on influenza viruses and, and you know, how likely this is uh, 
this might be to cause a pandemic through you know accident or or misuse or or uh, this sort of thing and by uh, calculating on a, on a very simple model basically just the probability that there's an accidental lab infection based on uh, reported lab incidents you know multiplied by the probability that that infected person um, then transmits that that infection onwardly and and multiplied by the death risk globally we get uh, various um, assessments of, of the risk of this sort of work, of um, work on influenza viruses uh, in laboratories. And Lipsitch's estimate basically says that, well, we might expect, uh, you, you know, in expectation somewhere between 2,000 and 1.4 million fatalities per high level laboratory per year. Um, now, these would manifest as occasional pandemics that might kill between 2 million and 1.4 billion people. But this seems like a horrendous risk. Um, you know, to, to, to face. Uh, on the other hand, other estimates have, have put the risk as very low, uh, one onward transmission event every 33 billion years of, uh, of laboratory work. Now, how do we interpret these sorts of, uh, of estimates? I think we interpret this by saying that the uncertainty is very much greater than the magnitude of the probability. So it's the uncertainty that is actually the important finding here. We really don't know. And that's just influenza. There might be um, other kinds of threats that that may be uh, that may be worse, you know. And and bear in mind that some strains of influenza have a have a case fatality risk of 30, 40, 60 percent. Um, but we might see organisms uh, with with that are greater threats. They may emerge from gain of function research or through um, synthetic biological manipulations, possibly creating things with uh, either intentionally or accidentally with a very high transmission. Um, rate and, and case fatality. They may be amplified by issues of antimicrobial resistance, which is a growing problem. And they may be the result of a laboratory accident, or they may escape from a laboratory, or they may be released deliberately. And, uh, and you know, this is of some concern because um, we really don't know what biotechnology is going to turn up in, in the future. Um, and, and, you know, Bostrom uh, recognizes this, this sort of uh, fact when he talks about uh, the vulnerable world hypothesis and he fears that there may be some technology which is so destructive and easy to use um, that it, it makes civilizational devastation extremely likely. So, uh, you know, and, and for, for more discussion on this sort of thing, I, I direct interested people to, to a recent podcast by Philippa Lentzoff on the FLI podcast, 1st of October, where, um, you know, she, she talks a lot about these, these sorts of, of risks. So can biothreats be existential risks? Well, look, the world was completely unprepared for COVID-19. So if a large, uh, impactful biological risk does emerge, unless we change uh, you know, the way we approach it, we're going to be just as unprepared for it. Um, the risk from laboratory work is clearly highly uncertain, both in probability and in what it might be possible to, to manipulate. Um, military work on bioweapons is, is secret and unknown. It's illegal, but, but uh, you know, the Biological Weapons Convention has been um, uh, disregarded in the past. Um, and look, a, a, a catastrophic bio biological uh, uh, threat could, could collapse social order and technological society if the impact of something as relatively mild as COVID-19 uh, you know, is anything to go by. Um, so look, it seems like a lot more analysis is needed uh, with respect to, to biological threats. But what might we be interested in analysing? Well, as far as government risk assessments go, often the, the risk assessment is performed uh, you know, on the basis of, of what are credible threats and then mitigations are put in place to deal with credible threats. But it's, it's debatable what a credible threat is or what the relevant credible threats are. Now, Look, I'll try and illustrate this by just drawing your attention to, to the graph here, which is a graph um, which, which puts in order the most severe weather events by financial impact in the United States. And what we see is there's a data point up here at $160 billion of impact, and that's Hurricane Katrina. Now, it is two and a half times more impactful than the next event, um, and the majority of bad events are kind of down here, you know, in the, in the 30 or 40 billion, uh, billion range. So prior to Hurricane Katrina, and this is an important point, prior to Hurricane Katrina, an assessment of the, of the, the, the maximum credible threats might have been down in this sort of you know, 40 to $60 billion range. 
Now that all went out the window when Katrina struck. And the point here is that uh, as soon, you know, before, uh, you know, the largest event ever strikes, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't really seem like it could be possible. And so um, worst case scenario thinking um, doesn't necessarily deal with the worst case scenarios and, and probabilities that we draw from historical data may, may not really capture the risk. And in fact, uh, you know, in addition to that, there may be um, changes in the, in the risk over time, particularly with advances in technology, any risk that depends on technology may, may rise over time. Um, or, or according to other human actions, such as you know, ongoing deforestation and ecosystem destruction and so forth. Collectively, all these, all these features uh, are, are of risk and, and worst case planning mean that we tend to systematically underestimate what the risk really is. And there's some other barriers, cognitive barriers and otherwise, that, that, that obstruct this process of assessing what the, what the true risk is. And they include things like groupthink, um, you know, in the New Zealand example, the, the pandemic plan was an influenza plan, and that's just because that's what the plan always had been, and that's what everyone in the Ministry of Health was thinking the plan should be. There's a general lack of problem finding. Um, you know, no one had, had really focused on coronavirus pandemics. They hadn't looked for, for that sort of uh, problem. You know, I'm, I'm talking about within policy, within government, you know, there had been academic studies and, and exercises. Um, but look, and a clear example of this is with, with the UK's um, National Risk Re Risk Register, which which only included risks from volcanism and from uh, foreign political interference after those uh, those risks had manifested themselves as harms to the UK, and there's no reason why they couldn't have been identified ahead of time. Um, so look, lots of other uh, uh, issues such as the, the interaction of risks. You look at the Fukushima. A nuclear disaster, which was an interaction of earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown. Um, you know the issue of short-termism, where governments often uh, discount um, the the value of the of the future, and therefore the risks that they pay attention to are those in the in the near term. Um, and various other you know kind of cognitive uh, blindnesses and and biases that we have that mean that we don't really uh, identify what where the true risk is and. I just want to, to illustrate this with, with, with the following image, um, which is constructed from data drawn from one of the earlier UK national risk registers, national risk assessments. And what it demonstrates, here's all the risks along the bottom, drought, volcanoes, infectious diseases, explosive uh, you know, storms, gales, coastal flooding. Pandemic is over here on the right. And the, the y-axis uh, demonstrates the, the risk, the likelihood uh, multiplied by the impact. And what we see here, and what, what should have been obvious, is that pandemics contain almost all the risk, more risk than every other risk combined. And this was known ahead of COVID-19, and yet this didn't seem to have been reflected in a proportionate investment in pandemic preparedness mitigation, not just in the UK, but around the world. Um, so as far as these sorts of risk assessments around biological risks and all risks really go, um, the time horizon needs to be longer. We need to include rare events. We need to include emerging risks. We need to include all the decision relevant information. And this means a true assessment of the actual worst case scenarios, because that may um, have, a, have a big influence on, uh, you know, on, on what decisions get made. And, and all these risk assessments and, and um, uh, interventions and policies need, need to be interconnected globally, because it's no use if one country is, is well protected, um, you know, uh, particularly with, with biological threats, we see that it's easy for them to, to flow around the world you know, un, uninhibited. Um, and and a, a graphic that's usually presented with these risk assessments is this, uh, you know, is this uh, risk severity matrix. On the left here, you see you know, a, a sort of typical one. There's probability along one axis and impact up the other axis. Um, and you know, things that are highly probable and highly impactful are, are critical risks and need to be addressed. But these, these matrices, they sort of equivocate over two, two very different kinds of risks. Anything that's unlikely but catastrophic sort of gets put in the same category as something that is frequent but has negligible impact. And that just seems wrong. And uh, particularly when um, an existential risk is, is really a qualitatively different kind of risk. It, it, it's the difference between you know, human beings existing and not existing. 
Uh, and so given that we're very uncertain about the probability of some of these, uh, of some of these scenarios, um, it seems that you know, a, a different kind of risk matrix might look like this one on, on the right here that I've sort of constructed where there's a, an entire row at the top of, you know, of, of highly salient risks. And these are the catastrophic and existential ones so that they're not equated you know, in the same or evaluated in the same category as the um, you know, uh, likely but, but negligible impact risk. So how do we approach um, mitigating biological threats and biological existential risks should any exist? The, the general approach to, to uh, epidemic and pandemic response is, is threefold, and it's, um, it's mandated by the international health regulations that, that all countries must have the capability to prevent, detect, and respond to these threats. Now, I've added a, a fourth uh, defensive slice, uh, slice of cheese here, which is the, the refuge idea. If prevention, detection, and response fails, and the threat is of such a magnitude that it threatens catastrophe or, or, or existential um, impact, then we really need to have the option of, of, of refuge, of, of retreating um, from, from the risk. So I just want to talk briefly about those four slices now. Um, so uh, look, a lot, has, a lot has been said about prevention of, uh, of biological threats, and, and I don't want to rehash a whole lot of it there, but it basically boils down to, to a few key points. We really need um, globally to, to somehow improve humanity's relationship with nature because a lot of these threats, they cross over from, from uh, animals you know, into humans. And uh, uh, in addition to that, we need to um, take uh, some sort of precautionary approach to biotechnology and bioengineering. Now, what that looks like and, and the degree of governance and regulation and so forth you know, can be debated, but, but something really needs to be done to, to guarantee um, laboratory safety uh, as the, the power of biotechnology um, uh, increases. We need to do something about the Biological Weapons Convention because uh, it, it hasn't been um, revised for some time. Um, it's at risk of being flagrantly disregarded. Um, and, and really, if we look at who is capable of developing and deploying um, powerful biological threats, it, it really is it's states and militaries and, and well-resourced. Uh, groups like this, we need to um, we need to implement these things that I've just outlined. You know, at the level of heads of state, so that things actually happen. And this was the recommendation of the independent panel uh, uh, reviewing the response to, to COVID nineteen. Um, as far as detection goes, uh, look, a lot needs to be done at the level of uh, international health regulations and the World Health Organization because the the raising of the alarm over COVID nineteen came came far too late. And partly that was because uh, there, there's no um, legal uh, option for these organizations to investigate outbreaks unless the, the country of origin has, has kind of notified them that, that there is an outbreak. But putting that sort of thing uh, aside, um, surveillance really needs to be better and, and it needs to be automated. Um, and, and there's various options for, for doing this um, disease surveillance. One example of this is that, uh, you know, buzz on social media may reveal um, when, when there's unusual events unfolding. And there's some evidence in preprint research that uh, there was a, a spiking of, of chatter about um, the term SARS in, in the Wuhan area in early December 2019. Now, that sort of signal could be picked up on and, and acted upon if, if, uh, if A, it was um, detected in real time, and B, if the rules were such that, that um, further investigation uh, was was allowed, and really we need to we need to recognise uh, what a global catastrophic biological existential risk will look like at its point of origin, because um, as I will conclude at, at the end of this talk in a couple of slides, the the response at the point of origin is really the key response. I'll come back to that just just in a moment, um, and and so look, uh, you know the the response um, needs to have three key features. It needs to be fast, it needs to be sizable, um, and it needs to be sustained over time to make sure that, that it has succeeded. And, and New Zealand's response sort of demonstrated almost accidentally these factors. You know, we, we closed the border almost by necessity, um, but then that allowed a, a speedy, speedy response to, to clamp down, to implement a lockdown and, and clamp down on the cases that were already there. 
and we sustained that border closure, the quarantine facility, and the um, and the the size of powerful lockdowns, uh, you know, briefly and intermittently over a long period of time. So, um, you know, look, a lot, a lot can be said about response, but but uh, really, it, it, it um, you know, it, it needs to be addressed, and and it needs to be to be more rapid and more sizable, perhaps than is intuitively. Um, uh, you know, then as intuitive. And, and this is because control of, of certain outbreaks becomes unlikely if certain response tipping points are exceeded. You know, if, if the capacity of contact tracing and testing, um, you know, is exceeded, then there's really no way of reining in uh, the threat. And, and these tipping points can come very quickly and, and they, they may come faster than expected. And this is because our, our cognition is, um, is built around, you know, linear thinking rather than exponential thinking. So understanding our own, how our own minds work, uh, you know, is, is essential for, um, for planning and, and strategizing uh, responses. But look, I just wanna, I just wanna spend, you know, the, the last few minutes talking about um, this idea of, uh, of, of refuges. Now, a, a refuge is a, is a designated area, you know, we, where a population is protected from some, from some threat. And in the case of, uh, uh, catastrophic biological threats or existential biological threats. Um, it, it's possible that an island may serve such a function a, as a final defense um, against uh, you know, failed prevention, detection, and response to a, to a truly catastrophic uh, uh, threat. And we, we have written a couple of papers where we sort of had this idea that, well, even if a, a biological threat ravages the world and it doesn't, it doesn't kill everybody, it, it, it may, Cause enough havoc and damage that that um, you know society kind of becomes unhinged and, and technological capacity sort of dissolves due to um, you know logistics issues and loss of uh, knowledge and, and technical ability you know through deaths and and so forth and it would be good to try and guarantee that there would be a hub uh, of of a, a thriving hub a flourishing technological society that can be maintained through a catastrophe such that it can then. Um, uh, assist or catalyze, you know, uh, uh, the emergence of a of a flourishing global society you know, after the event. So we, you know, n knowing that islands are prime candidates for for resisting the influx of disease, uh, given all the the historical data and and our modelling and New Zealand's experience and so forth, uh, we we basically ranked islands. Um, uh, we looked at islands greater than 250,000 population. We used 250,000 as a as a proxy for um, you know these sorts of the sorts of knowledge and technological capability and so forth that that might be desired uh, in a in a global society. And we ranked these islands on uh, on metrics of um, human capital, you know, remoteness and accessibility, the degree of health security in their health system, what sort of um, self sufficient capability they have, um, and what sort of hazards they're exposed to. To see, you know, which islands might be most suitable to succeed as a refuge if, if they planned ahead and, and were pre-designated as such, and it turns out that um, Australia, New Zealand, and Iceland seem most suitable to, to play this role. Now, that, that's not to say that other islands may not succeed at riding out a, a biological catastrophe. We've seen that Tonga, Samoa, and, and Nauru, and, and some other islands, you know, have have sustained zero COVID status, but they have much smaller populations, and, and they may not have the um, you know the the knowledge uh, uh, base and and know-how and so forth to to rapidly um, reboot you know global technological civilization after um, you know a, a truly catastrophic event um, and uh, you know so so our idea is basically that um, some islands may may decide that they want to to play this role and they may uh, you know build upon their uh, energy um, self-sufficiency, food self-sufficiency, and, and various um, health capabilities, and so forth, to and that you know to give them the best chance of, of succeeding at this. But uh, I've been talking a lot about speed of response. That any island designated as a refuge ahead of time really has to has to shut its borders as early as possible, uh, just in case that the threat the threat gets through, and the border closure really needs to be complete. Because as we've seen with New Zealand, even though we closed the border, we had this quarantine, 14 day quarantine uh, process, and there have been more than 10 incursions of COVID-19 into New Zealand, um, you know, since that was implemented. And so uh, 
if the if the threat was really one that was 100% fatal, you, you couldn't even risk that. Um, so you know this sort of situation it, it may require some sort of geopolitical discussions and you know and and agreements that um, the island will be left alone in such circumstances. You know for for the benefit of humanity rather than any particular state. Um, you know, but those details remain to be worked through at, at the moment. Um, you know, we've, we've proposed this as a, as a possible mitigation, mitigation strategy should a, an existential biological threat ever arise. So just two last points. One is um, that all the things that I've mentioned around prevention, detection, response, refuge status and so forth, um, investing in these, you know, it, it, it's not just about preventing existential catastrophe. It, it has cross-cutting benefits as well, and 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 we, you know, for for everyday health, and we can demonstrate this by, as we did in, in another paper, by correlating investments in global health security programs with scores on indices of you know global health metrics, um, of the global health security metrics, and and with um, deaths from communicable diseases, you know, like um, TB and HIV and so forth, and we found that you know, unsurprisingly, investments in this uh, in this stuff raise scores on these metrics, and these uh, and these metrics, you know, countries that score high on these metrics have have much fewer, um, uh, you know, far fewer communicable disease deaths. So, look, it, it's it's beneficial to to do anyway, even if there wasn't any, um, you know, any existential threat coming. So, look, just to summarise, you know, the take home message from me is really that you know that at the moment right now today pandemics uh, are, are still the greatest threat uh, to humanity now that may change over time as other threats you know ramp up like like ai or or you know or or the you know whatever but um but but right now today pandemics are are the threat um and so you know we need to think big on bio threats and um there's a whole lot of things i've listed here that you know that that could be that could be done or could be advocated for by countries that can't do them themselves uh, through international uh, fora and so forth. But you know, improving institutional prioritization processes so that the right threats get a proportionate amount of resources um, and paying more attention to these rare and catastrophic tail risks, um, you know, aiming for very rapid uh, response, which, which may look like you know, a huge initial overreaction at, at the point of origin, you know, in, in the case of COVID in, in Wuhan, you know, um, but but may ultimately save the world, you know, $25 trillion or, or you know, or, or, or human existence. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's important to, to develop um, decision tools and thresholds and metrics that can be referred to, you know, when they're needed, at the time they're needed, so there's no delay. Um, designating refuges as a hedge against extras might be might be useful, um, and also to bear in mind that look, biological threats are just one aspect in a portfolio of interconnected uh, potential catastrophic risks and risk factors and, and various synergies, you know, such as the combination of artificial intelligence and bioengineering, you know, may may have uh, you know compounding uh, impacts. And and look, I would advocate that um, global cooperation is is not only um, necessary, but it's it's rational. This is a, a positive sum game. Um, you know, if if everyone is is protected, um, then everyone is protected. Uh, and you know, just to just to to finish with with what I think the lessons of New Zealand's COVID response are, um, they're they're really that um, you know even COVID like breakouts can be quashed. Uh, again and again by strong measures, you know, at, at, at the point of emergence, and we've seen that in New Zealand and Auckland and, and elsewhere repeatedly, um, uh, that some of the best tools for, for managing these threats might be things that had been explicitly not considered or dismissed ahead of time. Um, and so it's worth pursuing, you know, research on the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of things, even if, um, you know, governments and policymakers are resistant to, to using them. Um, that acting you know, even earlier than you think is early is probably the best strategy. And the island refuges really uh, could be an effective last resort, um, you know, if, if enacted early. So um, look, there's a slide of, I've uh, just listed the references that I referred to in the talk, but I will, uh, I will finish there and, um, and uh, stop sharing my screen. Um, here we go. Thank you so much, Matt. There was a lot of food for thought in there. I'm very excited to ask you a couple of questions.
so we have a number of questions from the audience and I'm gonna write, dive right into them. Uh, so just to start off, uh, first question is, so you perhaps already know that um, from the recent work done by Toby Ord, for instance, uh, he seems to estimate uh, a one in 30 chance of human extinction because of man-made pandemics for at least the next coming to 100 years. Are you also thinking in the same order of magnitude or do you have slightly different estimations? Yeah, look, um, it, it's very hard to, to determine, you know, th these sorts of probabilities. I, look, I think we can say a couple of things. But I, I think that the risk from, from natural pandemics is, is lower than the risk from, uh, uh, you know, human created um, biological threats. Um, and that's simply just, you know, on the basis of, of the historical record and so forth. Um, so, so at least some of our efforts in uh, policy and mitigation and so forth should really be focused on, um, you know, on, on things like laboratory safety, biological weapons, norms, and, and, and this sort of thing. Um, the other thing that I think we can probably say with, with, with moderate certainty is that, is that the risk uh, from human-created biological threats is, is probably rising. And that's just simply because um, the power of our, uh, you know, ability to manipulate the biological world, uh, you know, seems to be increasing at a, at a very fast rate. So, so that fact alone really should be enough to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to force us into a position of, of, of caution. Now, obviously, there's all sorts of amazing things that we can do with biotechnology and, you know, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, mRNA vaccines, so forth are clearly one of them. Um, but, uh, you know, our, our understanding of biology is very incomplete um, and, uh, you know, unexpected results and unexpected events could certainly be on the curve. Absolutely. And I remember from your slide uh, somewhere where you, where you gave a formula for measuring uh, the risk from man-made pandemics, but ones that are accidentally created. So one of the factors would be accidental risk creation. So I was wondering what you would think of the chances of an intentional uh, creation of risk or a negligent yeah. one? Do you think it's somewhere in the same order of magnitude or are the probabilities a bit higher there? Yeah, so look, um, I, I would lean towards that the probability of something accidentally going wrong is, is probably is probably higher. And that's just simply because, you know, there, there are more and more and more um, sophisticated biological laboratories being built around the world right now as we speak. And, and so the, the breadth of uh, biological um, research and manipulation and so forth is, is expanding and expanding. And there's, there's many potential sites of accident or error um, you know, uh, around. As far as doing something, you know, deliberately, uh, first of all, most, most people, I would say, would not be trying to do that. So, that, so the number of actors that would, um, that would be pursuing this sort of goal is, is probably very small. And probably most of them um, uh, that have the capability to actually, uh, you know, implement their plan are those that have um, large amounts of resources, um, such as, you know, state-sponsored state um, actors or, or, you know, or, or militaries and, and so forth. So um, the risk is there, though, because I think there's, uh, as, as uh, biological manipulations become, you know, cheaper and easier, so to speak, um, the, the ability for small states or, or rogue states to, um, to wield great power, power disproportionate perhaps to their, to their international standing, um, you know, is there in, in, the, in the domain of, uh, of, of biotechnology. So, you know, it, it, it's probably, in, in my view, a lesser risk than a, than a sort of laboratory accident scenario, but, but it's still a very real risk. Right. Now, moving on to uh, the part about New Zealand. Um, so one of the questions that our audience has asked is, it's currently sort of commonly thought that COVID-19 is here to stay. It's going to be around permanently. We don't know how long, but at least as long as we can think. Uh, and it may be there's a chance that we can never exterminate it. What are your thoughts on that? Do you agree or do you think differently? Yeah, so my, my view on this has, has changed over time. Um, Prior to the, the Delta variant and, you know, and, and other highly transmissible variants, you know, we, we actually wrote a, a paper where we argued that, look, um, this thing is uh, able to be eradicated globally. And, and we justified that by noting that there were various features of, of COVID-19 that sort of placed it somewhere between polio and smallpox, you know, a, a disease that we have eradicated and a disease that we're on the verge of eradicating. But then the epidemiological features, you know, of, of Delta, 
um, are, are probably, uh, you know, make that much less likely. Um, and look, even in, in New Zealand, we, we have now, uh, Delta has arrived in, in, in New Zealand now. Now, we've only had one death uh, from Delta. Um, uh, and and we're for, you know although New Zealand was very slow to vaccinate in comparison to some other countries, you know 80% of the the vaccine eligible population has now had at least the first dose. So so you know the 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 risk of it running rampant is is less than it was you know at at, at the outset. Um, so you know the the 18 months we bought ourselves were 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 important months. Um, but you know look I, I I think it is probably here to stay. Um, in, in some form or another, maybe it, it will attenuate over time and, and you know slip in line with some of the other coronaviruses. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think that's a, a, a realistic view. Right. Um, with respect to the Delta variant, there has been some whisper around New Zealand's old strategy that maybe it's not as adequate or robust in handling and sort of mitigating or even eliminating uh, the risk of Delta uh, variant spread. Uh, do you think that's true? Is there any substance to that? But the, the, this, is a, this is a super interesting question. Uh, and, and what's happened in New Zealand with, with Delta is that um, it looks like, uh, so, so Delta arrived, and, and at the, when New Zealand had the very first case of Delta identified, the government actually decided to lock down at the maximum level immediately. Now, that actually did surprise me a little bit because it is very expensive to, to do these lockdowns and our vaccine level is, is rising. But that's what they did. And, um, you know, at first the, the cases, you know, rose a bit and suddenly there were, you know, over 100 cases, um, which wasn't surprising because it probably had been circulating uh, a bit before that first case was identified. And then the cases fell and they fell back down to, you know, daily cases of, of 10 or, or fewer. But then it rose again. And what happened when it rose again, it had, the, the virus had then got itself into uh, marginalised populations such as um, impoverished suburbs and gang members um, and these sorts of groups that are much more difficult to target with public health measures. They may be more resistant to vaccination um, and, uh, you know, and various you know, systemic factors mean that they may, they may not trust um, you know, health authorities and, and so forth. So look, I think there's an element of luck here as well. The, the, the strong lockdown measures in theory, should work just as well for Delta as they do for, for other variants. Uh, you know, the, the strongest lockdown, the trade-off is, is the cost, obviously. Um, but, but should it get into populations that are non-adherent to the restrictions, then there's really nothing you can do, I think. And so look, I think this, this brings the whole um, point back to, it's much better to keep it out than to have to respond with lockdowns and so forth. And for an island nation, if the, if the impact of the threat is sufficient, um, early border closure before it even arrives is, is probably a, a, a rational thing to do. No, absolutely. But do you think that would that by itself justify even stronger measures than the ones that have already been taken just because this time around, most vulnerable population seems to really be at higher risk as compared to other groups? Yeah, so that's, um, look, look, there's certainly an argument for that. And, and it depends what, what you uh, value in some sort of multi-decision, uh, multi-criteria decision analysis. So, you know, equity is obviously an important consideration, um, you know, various other health benefits uh, and so forth. But, you know, so too are um, freedoms and so too are, are economic considerations. And, and look, I would, you know, I, I'm, in a sense, I'm glad I'm not, you know, the, the decision maker. I, I can I can do, you know, some of these sorts of analyses and so forth and provide the information, but th these decisions are, are hard. Um, and uh, even at the outset, and, and I think looking globally, uh, my, my perspective is, and this is backed up by a, a range of studies with different methodologies, but, you know, it can be debated. Uh, globally, the measures taken to combat COVID per year of healthy life saved are vastly more expensive than what we normally spend on healthcare interventions across, across the health system. Now, does that mean that they were wrong? Does it mean they were right? You know, those are value judgments, but, but that's, you know, I think that's the, the, the general finding. So at some point, I think you have to give up on strong measures that are immensely expensive because they're just not sustainable. Uh, at the moment, government borrowing has been funding them, but, but that, you know, that can't go on forever. 
So in a sense, it's a shame that those strict, strong measures weren't implemented faster at the point of origin in each country when the virus arrived, um, rather than decision makers sort of umming and ahhing, deciding what will we do and, and chasing the virus rather than immediately getting ahead of it um, and stamping it out, which, which would have been the, the, probably the economically rational thing to do. No, absolutely. Well, with, as you said, how expensive these measures can get for some countries uh, to the extent that perhaps the country itself cannot afford it. Um, and I can think that, of... Look, yeah, go on. That, that, that's a super important point as well, I think, because if you, if you look at um, pre-COVID, there was a, an estimate by the World Health Organization that, that to bring 67 low-income countries up to a minimum standard of health security uh, would cost $100 billion. And then we have during COVID, the first US COVID stimulus bill, which was $2 trillion. So for the cost of 5% of the initial US stimulus bill, and there were subsequent stimulus bills, we could have financed 67 low-income countries to be raised up to a minimum level of health security, which as I demonstrated you know, in the talk, has, has spillover benefits for everyday healthcare as, as well as pandemics. So look, another point I would really emphasize is that the cost of some of these interventions is really quite cheap compared to the impact of, of something as, um, I, I hesitate to use the word mild, <laughs> as, as COVID-19, you know, and, 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 and the impact of anything worse is, is just gonna be even greater. Absolutely. Uh, so just maybe one experiential question. What do you, what do you, what did you feel as, your biggest challenge when you were trying to persuade leaders to respond to the COVID crisis in New Zealand in the initial stages? Yeah, so look, um, I, I personally actually wasn't involved in those discussions, but Nick, my, my co-author, uh, you know, certainly was. Um, I, think, I, I think this can be extremely difficult because everyone, whether leader or not, you know, they have, they have their own personal biases, they have their own cognitive biases, um, they have their own agenda, um, and, and you know, and, and to some degree, it's about it's about setting the tone and the debate and 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 all that ahead of time, so that the context in which the decision is being made is one that's amenable to that the right decision you know being made. And and I think as we've seen with with COVID in the heat of the moment, um, uh, a lot of poor decisions get made because they're made uh, on the basis of you know preconceived ideas or um uh you know or, or or various fallacies so look i think in new zealand we were lucky that at the time that the decision needed to be made we had a uh, a leader a prime minister who was um who was very much someone who you know who is who is empathic and and sympathetic to you know even relatively low levels of suffering and 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 so forth and so i think the the uh, decision was made more easily than it might have been, even if the same uh, information was being presented to, you know, to other decision makers. Absolutely. And what do you think, what kind of lessons can we draw from that sort of uh, leadership approach to cases where clearly leadership has failed and has had counterproductive impact for population at large, to the extent that in some countries, leaders have denied any COVID threat or leaders have denied any fatalities associated with COVID. How, how can, what can we learn? How can we learn from the New Zealand leadership that we've seen? Yeah, so, um, so you know, a couple of things. I, I guess, look, it's, it's to, to some degree, it's up to, you know, the people of the world to, to you know, in, in democracies anyway, obviously not every country is a democracy, to make wise choices about, um, about who they want to, to lead them and, um, and, and to consider, you know, a range of possible scenarios and, and which sorts of people they might trust to make the right decisions in those sorts of scenarios. Um, but, but look, beyond that, New Zealand, thankfully, you know, and I say not yet because, you know, maybe in the future things change, who knows, New Zealand is, um, is, is not yet uh, as polarised in, in its, um, you know, public, uh, uh, you know, beliefs and so forth as, you know, as some other countries are, for example, you know, clearly in the United States, there's, there's a, a degree of culture war going on. And so um, what that does is that then feeds up, well, it's bi-directional, but, the, you know, the, the culture war feeds up to leaders who then end up making decisions that are clearly, 
um, influenced by by the side that that supports them, you know, and then those decisions and and the leaders' rhetoric and so forth then you know feeds the the those sorts of culture wars and and you know and and, and I guess this brings me back to the point of you know bio threats are just one of a of a suite of of potential catastrophic risks and you know and, and things like you know infodemics, misinformation and disinformation and and things like um la you know lack of social cohesion and and, and social conflict are you know, are additional risk factors that will amplify the impact of, uh, you know, of, of these sorts of, of threats. So, so you know, we need to address these from all sides. It's not just about the biology. Absolutely. There are a lot, many questions, and I can see we're almost reaching the end of our hour. Uh, perhaps to end on a personal note, uh, your COVID research obviously has proved very influential in New Zealand. Uh, do you have perhaps any tips for other people who are trying to pursue influential and impactful research uh, or work in general in this area? Yeah, look, um, one of the struggles that I've had is because I'm independent, I, you know, I, I have to I have to find clients that, that are interested in pursuing you know, the sorts of projects I'd like to pursue. And, and so, you know, part of me um, enjoys the independence for various reasons. Uh, the flexibility and so forth, but but also, um, you know, I, I I suspect that had I if I had secure funding, you know, an institutional salary, um, I would use that privileged position to pursue more sort of out of the box thinking, more sort of um, big picture blue skies thinking, because if you're in that sort of position, um, you know, you you uh, you're able to do that to to a degree that that people that are working perhaps in the private sector and and so forth, um, you know, aren't aren't as free to do. So um, take take the opportunities you have. Thank you. Uh, with that, on that note, uh, thank you so much, Matt, for being with us today. And we learned a lot from you and we look forward to reading more about your research in the future. So thank you so much. Thanks very much. It's a, it's a pleasure.